Commerce Committee markup of the climate change bill. Live coverage on C-SPAN 3. The chair would like to recognize the um, gentleman from Nebraska if he wishes to be recognized. I think you've already uh, uh, spoken on your amendment, but uh, to refresh people's memory, why don't you uh, I take I appreciate time. that. This amendment eliminates uh, part of a discussion that's occurring within the uh, EPA right now, in essence, to add in uh, uh, international lands that have uh, particularly rainforest lands that have been uh, deforested and add that into the life cycle of ethanol under the assumption by the EPA that if you're uh, taking an acre away from uh, uh, food or seed uh, or, or corn or uh, soybeans that uh, would have been fed to animals and you turn it into a biofuel, uh, that that impacts other countries' decisions and, in essence, my cynical view, but essentially correct, that that forces uh, other countries to have to uh, plow up, so to speak, the rainforests and then plant food in lieu of what was taken out of the food stream. This is part of the uh, carbon lifestyle, uh, carbon life cycle of biofuels. Uh, I personally felt that the logic is more than fuzzy. It's beyond absurd even that uh, somehow we have to reach the assumption that let's say Brazil plows over part of their rainforest, uh, that it isn't something inherent to their economy, but something inherent to ours that forced them to do that. Uh, and so I want to eliminate that portion of the discussion in the EPA and their proposed rule about uh, factoring in and then having to uh, reforest lands uh, so, uh, by blaming it on ethanol, in essence. So that's, uh, that's the synopsis. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, lacks common sense to add in international land uh, use uh, into the life cycle of ethanol and biofuels. So that's the summary. I'm just waiting for anyone to ask me to yield. So uh, Would you yield to me? I would be glad to yield. The reason I, uh, with all due respect and admiration for the gentleman, I, I, I oppose his amendment is that the life cycle is important to take into consideration both on the direct and the indirect uh, results of the, the direct and indirect emissions. And uh, what we fear is that um, uh, we're going to encourage more uh, devastation in forests and other areas. And I know Mr. Markey is much well better versed on this, and I'd like, to, uh, if you would, to yield to I'd him. I'd yield uh, Mr. Markey. Because I, I know I'm against it, but I think he could really articulate why we're both against it much better. I, 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 I thank the gentleman very I'll much. I'll tell you what, why don't you yield back your time and we'll... I'll, I'll yield back my time and that way he gets his five right. minutes. The gentleman right. yields back his time. Mr. Markey is now recognized. I, I thank the uh, gentleman very much. Um, the gentleman's amendment would prohibit taking into account international indirect land use changes in the carbon accounting uh, for the Smartway Transportation Efficiency Program in the underlying bill. But what, as we have heard, his real concern is the impact on the renewable fuel standard uh, of the methodology that the EPA is developing to count carbon in biofuels. The 2007 energy bill included a huge increase in the use of biofuels, but also a commitment to expand the use of advanced cellulosic biofuels and, as part of that, biofuels that reduce global warming pollution the most. Accurately counting the global warming pollution from the use of biofuels is difficult. 
no question. The experts at EPA have put forward a proposed methodology. They are already receiving a vigorous response from stakeholders on the EPA proposal. This amendment would short circuit that process. We need to give the experts time to work through this difficult problem. The renewable fuels standard in the 2007 energy bill and the bill before us today were designed to enhance our energy security and reduce global warming pollution simultaneously. The gentleman's amendment would hamstring a crucial tool for ensuring that biofuels can reach their full potential to reduce foreign oil imports and global warming pollution. I urge my colleagues to let the EPA work through their process. I think that ultimately we should make our judgment based upon the facts as they are developed in this proposal. But make no bones about it, the EPA is going to hear from the ag community. The EPA is going to hear from every part of American society, and they should. This is a complicated answer to obtain. But I do not think that the gentleman's amendment intends to allow that process to continue. I think that we should rather than short circuit that process, allow for that process to continue. And then, then if it is within the judgment of the gentleman uh, to act, well, that will be the, the correct time. But I don't think acting now, we're going to intelligently understand what the impact is of this massive increase in ethanol production, not only here but around the world is. And as a result, uh, understanding whether or not the law of unintended consequences is being invoked as more forests, more area is being plowed up than the benefits that are being derived from the ethanol production itself in reducing greenhouse gases. That is something that we should know. Then we are acting intelligently. To deny ourselves the information which the EPA seeks to develop, uh, in my opinion, uh, will ultimately come back uh, to haunt us. So I urge a no vote on this. Uh, no decision has been made. The uh, EPA is in a fact-gathering uh, mode at this time. Uh, and at the point where there is a decision, uh, then we could act. But until then, I suggest we should at least learn what the facts are uh, and then make a decision. So I urge a no vote and I yield back the balance of my time. John, want time? Oh, yeah. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. Yes. Uh, strike the gentleman from course. Michigan is recognized. And I yield to my friend uh, from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, the uh, ranking member of the Energy uh, Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Upton, for, for yielding his time to me. Uh, this is a great debate. This stems from years of public policy here in Washington to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil, as I said in my original five minutes. The ethanol provisions, what is enacted by this, by this body, in the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. Now, I've been pretty accusatory about the job losses of the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 for those who followed me for many, many years. But I've always also said good public policy was done because it incentivized ethanol for the particular purpose originally for clean air. Ethanol was an oxygenate that originally was given market entry for clean air, which my colleagues on the other side supported. All right. Then we moved to 
the 2005 Energy and Policy Act amendments where we changed the debate. Let's said, let's decrease our reliance on imported crude oil. This is the only thing we've done in this in Washington, D.C., in the federal government to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil. In fact, for many years, I've been trying to get coal to liquid technologies. We've been trying to get natural gas to liquid fuels. There's only one thing we've done, one thing, to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil, and that's renewable fuels, and that's ethanol. So now, now we come to the last Congress where the Democrats agreed. And it was a Democrat Congress that said, we need to push the renewable fuel standard further. And why didn't my Democrats do that? Well, because they didn't want to drill in the Outer Continental Shelf. They didn't want to go to coal to liquid technologies. The only place they could go was renewable fuels. So they increased the renewable fuel standard. Investors started going. And some big companies, a lot of little farmers who developed refinery capabilities through cooperatives. And now we come to today. We come to this bill. And what this bill does is destroy what this Congress has been doing for over a decade to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil by this indirect land use. There is no way that the EPA is going to be able to calculate how a gallon of ethanol made here will impact a forest in Indonesia. And that's what Mr. Terry's amendment is seeking to strike. How does a gallon of ethanol produced here, how does that affect a rainforest in Indonesia? Mr. Terry is correct. In fact, the farm, we've all listed ag or industries that support this bill. Well, here's some who don't support the bill. American Farm Bureau Federation does not support this bill. The Fertilizer Institute does not support this bill. The corn growers do not support this bill. Why? Because they've been deceived by this Congress that we're going to move to decrease our reliance in imported crude oil by moving to a renewable fuel standard. So the corn growers do not support this bill. And the last one is the Illinois corn growers. Now, you all know me as supporting coal. The great thing about my congressional district is if you want energy security in this country, you want more supply, look to southern Illinois. We've got corn, we've got soybeans, We've got marginal oil wells that are still producing crude oil. We've got 250 years of recoverable coal that can decrease our reliance on imported crude oil, but it also can be moved and used in, of course, low-cost low electricity distribution systems. 1990, Clean Air Act amendments, renewable fuels and ethanol is good. 1995, the EPAC, renewable fuels is good. Last Congress, renewable fuels is good. Now, through this bill, renewable fuels is bad. Support the Terry Amendment. I Gentleman yields back his time. Um, we've debated this at length, but there are members who have uh, strong feelings about this on both sides of the aisle who are not going to be here if we go right to a vote. And so uh, what I will suggest we do is to put this amendment aside till I think 8.30 or sometime shortly after that when the members are scheduled to return. What is it? We'll have a debate, two minutes on each side, and then go to the vote. On this amendment, yeah. What? Uh, Mr. Pitt? For what purpose do you seek recognition? Strike last words. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, I'd like to ask the gentleman, Mr. Terry, uh, <clears throat> in your opinion, is this going to lead to uh, income transfers to foreign governments to rebuild the rainforest? Well, there's already within this bill I've read, and I don't remember what sections, but programs that allow uh, dollars to be transferred to help reforest. No, I think they're good. But, uh, 
the, to answer directly for other members is that the EPA is developing this rule on the carbon life cycle. I believe that's the ultimate goal, although under the bill, if it's passed, what happens is if indirect international land use becomes part of the life cycle, uh, the carbon life cycle of a biofuel, uh, that under this bill, all biofuels will just, you can't use them. Does he know that? Uh, if we continue to produce that under the Clean Air Act, uh, consumer or environmental groups could sue and actually stop the production of <coughs> biofuels. Uh, and, and I'll, I agree I'll yield to uh, Mr. Terry. Go yield ahead. back my time. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll yield. Go ahead. And <coughs> the point that Mr. Shimkus was making about the indirect international land use is right. To me, it's just scientifically absurd to connect a gallon of ethanol to the destruction of some trees somewhere else in the uh, international world. Uh, and so I want there to be a scientific study on carbon emissions of biofuels from the seed to the tank. But once you put in this nebulous, extremely vague uh, aspect into the EPA rule uh, defining the life cycle and carbon emissions of biofuels, then it only leads you to one conclusion. Uh, and so that's why we need to stop this rule or this aspect. I'm not saying stop the study on life cycle of carbon or the uh, carbon life cycle of a biofuel or ethanol specifically or biodiesel specifically. What I'm saying is don't use the uh, international uh, land use aspect of this because, frankly, there's no way you can reasonably say that uh, any destruction of a forest in South America or Indonesia or anywhere else is directly related. So let's end this absurdity, and frankly, I don't trust uh, the EPA and their rulemaking because I've seen examples where they develop uh, science to match what they ordered in the first place. So uh, this is a way to just say this is absurd. Let's not go there. Uh, uh, Joe, do you want any more time back? I'm done. Would the gentleman I yield, yield back to Joe? Would the gentleman yield? Thanks, sir. Yes. Oh, wait, I can't. Joe. Uh, I'll yield. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, and I understand the gentleman's attitude, but I don't think that any of us are in a position to say it's absurd. I, I just don't think we know. And that's the point of this wide open process that is taking place at the EPA with experts from all sectors now fighting. Uh, uh, at a table over what, in fact, are the consequences of the indirect impact here. And, and I'm, no one holds our profession in a higher regard than I do. And I think that we have a big role to play, obviously, in all public policy decisions. On the other hand, congressional expert is an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or Salt Lake City nightlife. I mean, they're just Compared to real experts, compared to real, you know, Louisiana, you know what I mean in Louisiana about that, huh? They're, what are they, the Utah Jazz? What is that, huh? <laughs> that, that's an oxymoron, huh? You know, so the... Uh, when you uh, dig a hole, stop. <laughs> Re reclaiming my time just before I agree with out. the gentleman on that, though. Thank you. I appreciate it. I thought we do have a section later in the bill that talks about international climate change adaptation programs. And... Uh, the, uh, the opportunity to re reply to the countries that are undeveloped for it, that spoke in Bali uh, and the climate change adaptations programs they make, possibility for income transfers, and that's why I raised the issue. And I yep. get back. Thank, Thank you. you. Joe, if you could yield so I... I'll yield to... Can I... Uh, unanimous consent to uh, put the corn grow national corn growers and the Fertilizer Institute's letters into the record. Without objection. And the Illinois corn growers. Without objection, that will be the order. Now, uh, 
I would like to put this aside uh, without objection. And we will uh, take it up uh, when members return who are attending the White House dinner at sometime around 8.30. And we will then call on uh, a proponent of the amendment for uh, two minutes and an opponent of the amendment for two minutes and then proceed to the vote. In the meantime, I'd like us to proceed to Title III. I understand that there are some members who have uh, extensive questions they want to ask counsel and issues they want to discuss in Title III. Uh, I know that, the, that Mr. Barton was particularly interested in doing this, but I would like to now recognize any member who wishes to go to Title III. Uh, Mr. Barton is here. Good. Mr. Barton has done a good job. You don't have much left on that plate. It's okay. I know we have to go to the White House. What's the situation? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, I'd like to now recognize Mr. Barton uh, to ask questions of counsel oh. in Title III, if you're, if you're ready to do that. I'm ready to do it. Okay. I am ready to do it. Let me get my... Uh, Gentleman will be recognized. I know he has an extensive question, so let me recognize. Well, I'll recognize you five minutes, and if you want more time, we'll give you even more time. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to. I can ask questions for probably the next hour, if that's the will of the committee, or I can ask questions for such time as you wish me to. Um, I, I do. Well, let's start off with a five minute increment. <laughs> Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Well, my first question. So on page 379, in line 5, it says, the quantity of the United States greenhouse gas emissions does not exceed 80 percent. Would you excuse me? Just, just for the members' information, we are not going to have any votes before 8.30 when the members come back from the White House. Then we'll proceed to uh, the, the last debate on the, um, on the pending amendment by Mr. Terry and then, uh, and then uh, go on to other amendments that may be uh, ready to be considered at that time. So uh, just so members know what the situation is, further to inform the members, uh, we, we have provided dinner on both sides of the aisle again. And uh, for this evening, we, uh, I've, I've been informed, have selected Lebanese food. Some people call it Lebanese food. Some people call it Turkish food. Some people call it Israeli food. Some people call it Greek food. It's the, it's the food of the Mediterranean. And if only the people in the Middle East could understand they share uh, many things, including their food, then uh, cultures, they ought to learn to live in peace, just like this committee is going to be able to do at some point. At some point. Okay. I recognize <laughs> I, I'm going to give the uh, gentleman his full five minutes. Thank you for allowing me to make that announcement. On page 379, line 5, the, <clears throat> the quantity, the goal for greenhouse gas emission reduction in 2020 is not to exceed 80 percent of the <clears throat> emissions target in 2005. But in the very next page, or several, on page 380, um, line one, the quantity of greenhouse gas emissions from cap sources does not exceed 83 percent. You've got a 3 percent discrepancy. What, why is that? Uh, section 702, uh, which has the, uh, the 80 percent on page 379, uh, applies is a is an overall goal that applies to the quantity of US greenhouse gas emissions section 703 uh, <coughs> applies only to cap the greenhouse gas emissions of capped sources and then why why on page 379 are the percentages for 2012 which is 97 percent in 2030 which is 58 percent in 2050 which is 17 percent, why are they identical uh, in Section 703? And the only difference between 703 and 702 is in 2020. 
that's because the bill is written so that the the targets and the goals are identical for three of the four years that are specified, but for 2020 they are different. Is is, is council aware of the policy reason for that? The the, the statute says that, that they are the same for three Markey. of the four years and that they are different for the sec for the uh, 2020 target. Would Mr. Markey care to comment on that? I, I'm sorry. Uh, could, you, could the gentleman uh, restate well, this inquiry? There has been much gnashing of teeth on your side on Section 703. Uh, Mr. Um, Boucher, among others, labored long and hard to get the, uh, uh, the amount of capped uh, sources uh, down to 17 percent. Um, instead of eight, instead of 20 percent, but the goal didn't change for 2020. The goals don't change for any of the other targeted years except that year. I'm just I'm curious as to why there's a, a difference on that one targeted year between the goals and the capped emission sources. If, if the gentleman would yield, the the um, the twenty percent is an aspirational goal. The seventeen percent is the goal set for regulatory purposes, uh, in terms of what uh, reductions in greenhouse gases would be well, achieved. Well, why the difference in aspirational goals? In that only, that's the only year there's a difference between aspiration and requirement. Yeah, it, it's a it's a goal that's established so that the economy as a whole can try to do better. But in terms of the regulatory um, uh, 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 benchmarks that are established in the legislation, the 17 percent number uh, is the operative number. Okay. Well, let's go to section 704, <clears throat> supplemental pollution reductions. Um, First of all, what is a supplemental pollution reduction? That, I don't believe that term is defined in the statute. <laughs> we, we just have it hanging out, begging for definition. The, the statute provides that a, uh, that a specified number of allowances will be used to get the supplemental pollution reductions and then on page 381 it says that that shall provide greenhouse gas reductions in an amount equal to an additional 10 percentage point of reductions from U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2005. Okay. <coughs> um, what does this mean? Activities supported under Part E shall provide greenhouse gas reductions in an amount equal to an additional 10 percentage points of reductions from the United States greenhouse gas emissions in 2005. Yes, it, sir, it, it cross references uh, <coughs> Part E. And if you look on page 515, it does define supplemental emission reductions there to mean greenhouse gas emission reductions achieved from reduced or avoided deforestation under this part? Well, I can read, but I don't understand the, again, this may be a question to the, uh, one of the authors. What's the intent of this? Are we trying to get an additional 10 percent CO2 or greenhouse gas re reductions in addition to the, the capped target um, on page 420 for that particular year? Using five percent of yeah, the the uh, goal. If you the this are you back in the supplemental pollution reduction uh, yes, section? Sir. Yes. Um, the since um, twenty percent of all greenhouse gases internationally are released uh, because of def uh, because of deforestation. Um, this section is intended. 
uh, to create uh, the uh, incentives for uh, a huge um, a percentage of gains to be reached by preventing deforestation in a very cost-effective way um, that, in fact, uh, reduces the need to reach other parts of our economy to ask uh, in the near term uh, for reductions to come but from my, our economic engine. So, my, my uh, so question. this program is intended to create the uh, uh, the uh, incentives for that to be. You 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 want an additional 10 percentage points in CO2 reductions from the United States. I don't see how you're going to do that. It, it is equal to an additional 10 percentage points. Right. It's in an amount equal to. <laughs> okay. So that's going to happen overseas. That is correct. You hope it does. We hope it does, and um, and we will <clears throat> ensure that there is a monitoring program put in place that uh, that uh, reflects the importance of ensuring that the program does work. Okay. Let's go to um, section 705. And <coughs> say that the, the gentleman's oh, time I'm has sorry. expired. I admit it has. He is at eight minutes right now. And, uh, I'm just getting started, though, Mr. No, oh, I know that. I know that. Um, and, uh, but I think that we should go to the other side briefly and see right. if there are any members uh, on the majority side that uh, would seek recognition at this time. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it appropriate to offer an amendment now, since we're, you've come over to this side on Title III? It, it, may I be recognized, Mr. Chairman? I'd be happy to yield to uh, Mr. If, if the gentlelady would like to yield to the gentleman it, from Texas. It yes. was my understanding that this time was going to be used asking questions on Title III and that we wouldn't go to amendments. I, I think that the agreement that Mr. Waxman reached and announced was that amendments could be considered during this period of time, but there would be no roll calls. I uh, didn't agree to that. No recorded votes until... I did not agree to that. All right, then uh, let us... So, uh, reclaiming my time, if there isn't anyone on our side that has questions, then wh what are we going to do until 8.30? Have Mr. Barton keep asking questions? We're going to take a brief... Uh, we're going to suspend here for, uh, for two minutes. Good idea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will uh, 
the, the committee will um, uh, recommence. And uh, I, I want to continue to recognize the gentlelady from uh, California uh, and uh, ask if she has uh, any additional um, points which you would like to make. Uh, other than my amendment, I don't. No, it would, it, I, I thank the gentlelady. Oh. Um, we have an agreement okay. um, that uh, we have reached that will allow any member who wishes to ask questions uh, with regard to the contents of the legislation to do so. Uh, and then um, uh, we will proceed to an amendment made by the minority, which in the opinion of the minority will last some time because of the importance of that amendment, uh, which would then take us up to the period of time that is 830 that uh, we expect the members who have been invited to the White House for dinner to return. And at that point, uh, the debate could continue, but yet with the members here, that would allow us to have a roll call that they could participate in. So we won't be rolling any, we will not be rolling any additional roll calls. Uh, we will only be uh, having a vote on that one roll call that we all agreed that we would vote on, uh, but any subsequent amendments which we debate uh, will be voted upon uh, without having been rolled. So only questions, Mr. Chairman, about the entire bill? Questions. And uh, no amendments being offered with votes held? No, there, 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 there uh, could be an amendment which is offered, but it will be an amendment which the minority, in its opinion, uh, will or be, be a are a majority member, but it will be a minority member, I think, that um, will spur such significant interest that it would clearly not be completed. That is the debate portion of that amendment until after 8.30. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, there are other members seeking uh, recognition for discussion about uh, the legislation pending before us. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's go back to um, uh, <clears throat> section uh, seven, 704, I mean 705, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh, requirement that the administrator uh, do a series of analysis and issue reports and paragraph three of section, subsection A requires an analysis of the status of worldwide greenhouse gas reductions efforts, uh, including the implementation of, of, of this act and other acts. But then in the very next uh, paragraph, paragraph B, it says, except that paragraph three of subsection A shall not apply. Now, my question is, why do you require, why do you require Joel? in the paragraph Joel? above Joel. that we do why this analysis that? and have this report, and in the very next section, you say, but you really don't have to do it. That makes no sense to me. No, don't solve any of it. It's required in subsequent reports. Uh, the statute provides that it is, uh, paragraph three only does not apply to the first report. But my question is, why? Why is there an exception here? Why require a report, report but then not require it the first time? The of worldwide greenhouse gas reduction. The first report comes out in 2013, including implementation of the Safe Climate Act, which starts in 2012. Mm. So, okay, good. This is a quadrennial report, so to have the first one do it in 2013, which is one year after that. Yes, the, um, this uh, program starts in 2012. There are quadrennial reports under this section which are uh, required, uh, and that is why that first report is not uh, required. That is, as you refer back to uh, subsection B, the exception, uh, because a study could not be completed by 2013 since the program starts in 2012 uh, and it, the section calls for 
a, a report to be uh, but it, it, it says an analysis of the status of worldwide greenhouse gas reduction efforts, including implementation. I mean, I don't. It's it's a minor point. It just it's it seems ludicrous to require a report and then not require it. But I didn't write the bill, so let's go on to the next page on page 383, where we're you know, talking about trying to get the latest scientific information, which I think is a good thing. Um, I will point out that it, you have to do it. This, this is a report that the United States EPA is going to prepare, and it's by country. So it's a worldwide report, um, including the annual total of CO2, the annual per capita, the cumulative anthropogenic emissions for the top 50 emitting nations, that's no small feat. Uh, and then it, in, in paragraph B on line 11, uses the term, has to report on significant changes, both globally and region, in annual net non-anthropogenic, which means made by God, greenhouse gas emissions from natural sources. My question on, on 11, page, on, on line 11, is what is significant? What's the definition of what constitutes a significant change globally and region in annual net non-anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions? That's a fairly, a fairly uh, um, significant requirement. Significant, uh, significant on this for this paragraph is not defined in the statute. It would be left to the administrator to determine as part of the analysis. Does my esteemed friend from Massachusetts care to comment? I mean, that's that is a fairly large requirement to to comment on, I mean, it's undefined. Well, I think the EPA administrator, in her or his discretion, um, will be able to make that determination. It's going to be their call. Yes. All right. Let's move over to um, page 386. This is again a reporting requirement. Um, in assessing risk and impacts, use a risk management framework, including both qualitative and quantitative measures to assess the observed and project projected impacts of current and future climate change accounting for both monetized and non-monetized losses. What is a non-monetized loss? A, a loss that has not been converted into dollar terms. That's not an answer. What's, what's an example of a non-monetized loss? Species extinction. So it, it would be um, a species lost. Uh, it could be uh, a vast ecological uh, loss that is related uh, to uh, greenhouse gas emissions or other <coughs> impacts. Right, would the gentleman yield just for a second? Down here, uh, Ranking yeah. Member Barton. Th this brings up a great debate on when I read through the draft, the initial draft. And everywhere in this provision, there's, all, there's, there's quite a few places where we talk about the damaging effects of global uh, warming. But this, in the draft, now I haven't read the uh, manager's amendment, but there's nowhere that I remember reading of listing or having the EPA director list and account for any of the positive F, F effects of global warming. Uh, would the uh, chairman, uh, can the chairman count if there are positive effects of global warming, should they not also be accounted for by the Environmental Protection Agency? Uh, under, uh, under the, um, under the uh, language on page 386, uh, lines uh, 10 to 14. Uh, it says, in assessing 
um, risks and impacts use a risk management framework including both qualitative and quantitative measures to assess the observed and projected impacts of current and future climate change. So those, so, impact, those impacts, of course, will lead. If what the gentleman is saying is in certain areas perhaps there is a warming climate, uh, then those uh, impacts could be uh, noted if there were. So the positive impacts of global warming will be addressed by the administrator in this process. Impacts. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, negative impacts and positive impacts. Well, the the um, well, I, I suppose. I mean, uh, that under, under that under that you know using that definition, I, I don't think we're going to put in negative and positive, but yes, impacts, and under that would be all impacts. So, the, I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. I could ask you a question about nonlinear, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go to page 387, and this one is um, a little more important. Um, on line six, describe the increased risk to natural systems and society that would result from an increase in global average temperatures of 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 2 degrees Celsius, above the pre-industrial average, or an increase in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations above 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. My first question is, why those numbers, why 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit and 450 million parts per million of CO2 equivalent. And then my second question is, what is the pre-industrial average? Yeah. Th those are the numbers that were identified by uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the United Nations as uh, triggering points for more uh, severe uh, uh, consequences as a result of uh, uh, of a warming uh, planet. Well, what, and what, so for, what is the pre-industrial average that is referred to? The pre-industrial average is 280 parts per million. Uh, it has now uh, increased to a range of 360 to uh, 380 parts per million. Um, so uh, essentially the what they are referring to the is... The pre-industrial average of temperature. I will stipulate that you are right on your CO2 number. That is that's good. You have been doing your homework. Thank you. The number I had was 250 in 1850, and the number I have today is 380. Mm -hmm. So we are in the ballpark on that. Mm -hmm. But this 3.6 degree Fahrenheit number I am not familiar with, and I, I honestly don't know what the pre industrial temperature average that they refer to is. Well, I, I, it's fairly important. I think I think what you would do is you would just uh, let, let's just do some subtraction here. Then it would be uh, three. It, it, if it, it, once it goes 3.6 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit above pre-industrial average. Now, uh, uh, off, the top of, off the top of my head, I don't know what that number is. I do know, however, uh, that the National Academies of Science represented. Uh, from all the countries of the world in the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on, on Climate Change have come to that conclusion. And so it is, it is a, a number which is the consensus number of the scientists of the world uh, who uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, on this subject uh, two years ago. And, uh, and I think it's a good number, and I'm not willing to second guess it. I think it's a, it's the well, number we should be working. I think it's I think it's a number the American people deserve to know. And let me tell you why I think that. My information is that since 1850, I don't know what the pre-industrial average for temperature is. I don't know, but I am led to believe that that the the average temperature in the United States since 1850 has gone up about one degree Fahrenheit, one degree. And I am told by scientists that are much smarter than I am that if we implement fully this 83 percent reduction in CO2 
by the year 2050, which is the target in the bill, and it is the has the amount of carbon or carbon equivalent, CO2 equivalent, over on page 421 of this bill, that the measurable temperature change is going to be less than one-tenth of one degree Fahrenheit. Now, this is a political question more than a question of the council. Why in the world do we put the U.S. economy through an, through an economic ringer like we're probably going to do if this bill were to become law when the temperature between 1850 and today has gone up about one degree Fahrenheit and regardless even if we meet these targets for CO2 reduction the the measurable temperature change between now and 2050 is about one tenth of one degree Fahrenheit so this on page 387 this 3.6 degree Fahrenheit and this pre-industrial average are non-trivial inflection points. I don't dispute what the chairman just said, that that that, that 3.6 degree number is mentioned in the IPCC. You're right about that. But I don't, I don't know what the pre-industrial number is, and if I'm right that the temperature increase in the last 150 or 160 years is about one degree. In the next 40 years, it's even if you go to these great reductions that you're talking about in your bill, you get at most one tenth of one degree in Fahrenheit temperature change to the negative. Is that worth the pain and suffering we're going to put the U.S. economy through? Well, and, that, and that's a political question. Okay, if you now, and I appreciate that, and I, th I thank the gentleman for asking the question. Um, we are. We're working off of the best science uh, that can be provided, and that is the collective judgment of uh, the scientists of every country in, a, in the world, uh, which came to a consensus uh, in a series of four reports, uh, which they issued uh, back in 2007, uh, which uh, has become uh, the undisputed working well, I can't say undisputed. There are some that still dispute these numbers. However, uh, the numbers, uh, for the most part, are those adopted now by every country in the world uh, in terms of what does constitute um, an increased level of CO2 emitted to the atmosphere in terms of uh, an association uh, with dangerous climate change. So that is the uh, working uh, premise that uh, we are using. That is the premise which the European community is uh, using, uh, and that is the premise that we are going to ask the Chinese and Indians uh, to use as well. Uh, in fact, uh, the head of this group, the IPCC, uh, Dr. Pachuri, was an Indian. And so uh, this is a, a consensus uh, that not only American scientists uh, but Indian and Chinese and other scientists accepted. In fact, however, there have been scientific reports since then that indicate uh, that there has been an even more rapid uh, increase um, in uh, the danger to the planet. But for the purposes of what we are discussing right now, we are using the IPCC numbers. And, um, and uh, we believe that that is the best scientific um, uh, information available. So our bill is science-based, it's technology-driven, it's market-oriented, and it's consumer-focused. Uh, but ultimately, it's science-driven. Okay? We are relying upon uh, the science as it has been developed by the best people in the world. Well, now, I, the gentleman, again, is uh, at 11 minutes right now, and, and I will come right back to him, if you don't mind, no, no, after I seek recognition of any member. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Um, <clears throat> I think Mr. Barton raises an interesting point. I thought it was uh, worth responding to. Uh, one of the things that people argue is that if the United States reduces its carbon emissions by 80 percent, it's meaningless because essentially the world could continue to warm regardless. And 
I don't agree with the numbers that Mr. Barton has shown out of the relatively de minimis change because I've seen estimates that are much higher as far as how much we would vary the temperature just by United States action. But I want to note that all of us, I think Democrats and Republicans alike, agree that if we achieve this 80 percent reduction, it is not going to save the planet alone. It's going to require the rest of the world becoming engaged in this effort. Now, the number that Mr. Barton threw out is if the United States achieves an 80 percent reduction, it might have a relatively modest result, at least as a number. But if it allows the rest of the world to move forward, encourages, inspires, and in some sense requires the rest of the world to move forward, we can, in fact, and the IPCC report makes clear, stabilize stabilize the Earth's temperature at about two degrees uh, increase above the uh, time, th the situation we have today. Now, this is the consensus product of the world's scientific community. They have said in rather confident terms, if we reduce global, global uh, CO2 emissions, uh, by 50 to 60 percent, we can stabilize the climate. If we do not, we have the potential of runaway uh, global warming. And I want to refer to you to an MIT study that was just published uh, yesterday in, and this is why this is a, a very timely debate, uh, and I'm just looking for the, the name of the publication. It was in Science Daily published yesterday. And the title was Climate Change Odds Much Worse Than Thought. This was an MIT study uh, using a, a new sophisticated computer analysis that basically has, has concluded that the median probability of surface warming is 5.2 degrees Celsius by 2100 in the uh, business as usual case, with a 90 percent probability range of 3.5 to 7.4 degrees. That's compared to a median projected increase in 2003 of 2.4 degrees. The point I want to make is, is that the science is now rapidly leading to the conclusion that this problem is greater and faster than we thought just a few years ago, and that this is a consensus of world scientific opinion. So I guess the, the, the fundamental point I would make is even if we conclude that American reductions will not save the planet singularly, we know it is imperative to get the world to act jointly so, in fact, we can save the planet. And for those who argue that we should not take this action, it's kind of like when you try to get your kids not to throw their junk out the window of the car. And they say, well, gee, Dad, somebody else will just throw stuff out the car. And if I refrain from throwing my junk out the car, it will only reduce the total impact of refuge by 0.15%. We still don't throw the stuff out the car window. And I know that sounds maybe simplistic as, a, as a, an analogy globally, but I think it is a real one. So I would suggest we're on the right track here and uh, hope we succeed. Great gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from, uh, from Michigan. Yeah, uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions to, for the council. Th I thank the chairman. Um, on page 381, uh, I have a question for the council regarding the administrator's review of the program in the bill. As you know, China and other developing nations refuse to provide emissions data to the UN with the same frequency and accuracy as the U.S. And the date of emissions for China's most recent UN submission, I'm told, is for the year 1995, 14 years ago. So. I notice here that the administrator shall, in consultation with appropriate federal agencies, submit to Congress a report not later than July 1, 2013, and every four years thereafter. Are there any provisions in this uh, substitute or in this uh, bill regarding enforcement or data from international emissions uh, that would be of the same type of quality? Is there any reference that I may look at or not? 
In other words, we're we're required to submit this information uh, or make it public to the Congress. Is there a similar standard for China, for India, for other nations within this bill? Is there something that we can compare apples to apples with? Sir, are you are you asking if there is a requirement in this? Yeah, is there something China in this? Yeah, is there submit data something to that, the United States that we're aware States? of? And maybe I can relay that to the chairman, Mr. Markey. I don't know if there's some international data that that we can compare this to. Just know, as I said, that. The, the, I, the I, last I, emission I, data we I, had was 1994. I don't know if it's been updated. I don't know what requirement that there is. Whether the I thank the gentleman. Yes, I, I thank gentleman. the gentleman. A as a matter of American domestic policy, we cannot mandate that the Indians or Chinese do anything. However, if you turn to page 381, that's where I'm at. Line 19. Uh, there is a requirement uh, that the administrator of the EPA uh, conduct, and th that now move down to line 19, an analysis of capabilities to monitor and verify greenhouse gas reductions on a worldwide basis, uh, including for the United States uh, as required under the Safe Climate Act. So, so we're going to we do this for them? Well, again, th there is a, a, a cumulative uh, impact of, of CO2 on the planet as a whole. So it is in our interest to try uh, as best we can uh, to identify where the sources of greenhouse gases uh, on the planet are emanating from. Has anyone talked to the Chinese to see if they'll be cooperative? Uh, to the point of if the gentleman would yield, the, the point of our moving forward is that the President can have a meaningful negotiation with the Chinese Indians and others in Copenhagen this December. Um, that is why we have constructed this legislation with um, long transition uh, protections for our trade um, uh, sensitive um, uh, industries. Um, so that uh, there cannot be a uh, uh, action taken by China or other uh, nations in the near term, uh, so that there can be a regulatory scheme put in place uh, on a global or at least sectoral basis, uh, depending upon the industry, uh, that does lead to monitored um, greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and reductions uh, uh, from uh, those sectors. Well, I Later on, I intend to offer an amendment uh, that would require all of this to be WTO compliant, and maybe that stick will will help the, the Chinese if that amendment is adopted to comply. And maybe I could make it a bipartisan amendment. With well, yourself. again, if the, the, the gentleman should understand that our legislation does, in fact, um, give the president the authority to um, to put in place um, a tariffs. Uh, ultimately, uh, th that construct will be made by the Ways and Means Committee uh, in, in the event that there is um, noncompliance by the Chinese or other countries. Okay. I might ask the Council whether there is some place in this bill that offsets from China are allowed under the bill. There is an international offset. J just a minute. Any country, if, if the gentleman would deal, any country which is a signatory to the treaty, um, uh, to a treaty, and that is, um, uh, and that is um, compliant with the standards established for offsets would qualify. Okay. 
My time has expired. I yield back. Let me just note the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we have, this is an unusual um, amount of time that we have just to ask some questions, pose some questions. I don't have questions of the council. I have a question of, uh, of the ranking member of the committee. Could uh, we welcome our former colleague and yeah. senator from Ohio, <laughs> Mr. Brown? Is that nice? He's sitting right down here there by Jay Inch. Making noise in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome. He is um, having a chuckle. <clears throat> he is. Uh, and he's, it's great to see him back here. Um, in listening to the, the debate, and certainly the, um, the ranking member um, is the leader of it, uh, for the most part, obviously, uh, opposed I wish I were winning to the, the, uh, to the, uh, to the <laughs> legislation. Um, I just have one question that I'd like to ask you. All right. Do you believe in the accumulated science uh, that, the, uh, that there is indeed global warming? I accept that CO2 concentrations have gone up since 1850. I accept the, the uh, scientific consensus that, about where they are now. I accept the, uh, the uh, uh, probability that in the next hundred years they're going to go up into the neighborhood of 500 parts per million. I accept that. Um, I do not accept that the, um, um, it's been proven that uh, CO2 drives temperature. I think it is just as possible that temperature drives CO2. The th that was the prevailing theory until about 25 years ago that, that, that uh, CO2 was a dependent variable and that it rose as a result of temperature increases. That's what the ice ring data and all that uh, appears to show. Um, I do accept that there has been some warming, but the, the models that predict the catastrophic warming uh, are n not proving very reliable in predicting what's happening on an annual basis. Uh, the the Average world temperature has gone down the last seven years in a row. It has not gone up, and and, and so I think it is unwise to adopt a radical uh, regime like is imposed in this bill uh, that will have significant cost to our economy uh, without any significant uh, uh, verifiable change in 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 what appears to be the uh, emerging temperature patterns. Mm. I mean, I'd, the, um, there are a large number of scientists, not just a few, but a large number of scientists that, that would come before this committee and testify under oath that the temperature gradient differential 50 to 100 years from now uh, is not going to be measurably different um, if we adopt and implement successfully these radical CO2 and other greenhouse gas emission reductions. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciate the gentleman's um, response. And um, I, I think anyone listening is, uh, A, struck with your sincerity. And I do believe that you are sincere. I am. You are sincere in your belief that what so many on this side believes is uh, one of the, the great challenges of the 21st century, um, that your sincerely held beliefs are different than the body of science that has instructed us and, uh, and why we're embarking on this bill. Now, I mean, this uh, obviously was not a trick question, but I, I think that since I would have never brought it up unless we had this time while we're waiting for members to come back. Um, but I, I really wanted this to be part of the record because uh, you most sincerely see this the way you do, and um, well, it's not. I, I, I respect that. I respect it's that. It's not just I, me. I, I, I don't agree, but I know it's not just me, though. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there are a large, large number of very well-informed scientific climatologists that agree with what I have stipulated. 
So it's it's not just a personally held belief. Yeah, well, I thank the gentleman. I mean, you've always been my friend. We've done other bills together. It doesn't look like we're doing this one together, but uh, uh, did you want me to yield I, time the general, to you? Yeah, would the gentlelady yield? I'd be glad to. Thank you, I, Mr. I, Barton. I thank the gentlelady. And, and again, that's the essence of the debate. And, and I think this is not a bad period of time to have. Maybe we'll, this is like the halftime uh, analysis, um, uh, you know, uh, update of where we are right now. We believe on our side that the science is sound, that, um, that the planet is running a fever, that there are no emergency rooms for planets, that we have to act in a preventative way in order to ensure that we avoid the worst consequences of climate change. We also on our side believe um, that there will not be uh, a severe economic uh, impact uh, that our country uh, that our country suffers from if we act. In fact, we believe just the opposite. We believe that we can unleash a green uh, uh, jobs revolution in our country and that it will provide a brand new uh, manufacturing sector for us. So there are uh, big differences in how we view the science uh, and the opportunity. All right. And uh, and, uh, and that's what this debate is going to be all about for the rest of this evening uh, and all day tomorrow and into the night. Uh, the gentlelady's time has expired. Are there any members on the minority side that would seek recognition? The <laughs> gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. I know you looked everywhere. I want to go to page 397. Um, and it this is where the, um, they have to designate uh, greenhouse gases for, for control purposes. I would point out for the record that it's not just CO2, it's also methane, nitrous oxide, sulfur, hexafluoride, hydrofluorocarbons, any perfluorocarbon, nitrogen, trifluoride, and on the top of page 397, any other anthropogenic gas designated as a greenhouse gas by the administrator. My question on line six, it, it talks about in determining whether the, the administrator designates this as a greenhouse gas, it says determine whether one metric ton of another anthropogenic gas makes the same or greater contrib contribution to global warming over 100 years as one metric ton of carbon dioxide. My question to council is, what is the contribution to global warming over 100 years of one metric ton of CO2? I think it's zero. What does one metric ton of CO2 over 100 years make to global warming? That's the standard in the Act to, to, to designate a, a man-made gas as a greenhouse gas and subject to regulation. It would seem to be that we would know the answer to that question. Not. Does council, would council answer that question? I doubt that she would have the answer to that. The, the, the statute provides that everything is compared to CO2 and there are uh, later on in the bill in section 712 we give the comparisons for other gases. I understand gases that. Carbon but dioxide nowhere in the, and I've read it, there's nowhere in this act does it say what that standard is. Now, again, let's just let's put some math on the table. The United States generates about 7.2 billion metric tons of CO2 man-made a year. 7.2. All the nat from natural occurrences, we get about 15 billion. So the total creation of CO2 in the United States on an annual basis is approaching 20 billion metric tons, 20 billion metric tons. One metric ton of CO2 over 100 years is 100 metric tons. In the overall scheme of things, that is not a lot of CO2. That has got to be a 
so if there is a metric that says how much that contributes to global warming, I've never seen it. And everything in this act is based on that metric. So we should be able to call down to EPA. I don't expect the council to know that. She's not a climatologist. I don't expect Chairman Waxman or Chairman Markey. No, I know it. Do you know it? I know it, yeah. Well, okay. What is it? What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is the contribution to global warming over 100 years of one metric ton of carbon dioxide? Everything in this act is based on that standard. May I ask the council, is that true? Is everything in the act based on that standard? Your regulatory regime is. The, 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 the annual tonnage limit and the allowances are based on the uh, comparing other gases to the uh, amount of global warming that's caused oh, by that's one right. ton, one metric ton of carbon dioxide. And that the statute does on page 405 reference the uh, global warming potentials that are given in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment. And I accept report. those. I've re reviewed them. I don't have they're, they're scientifically correct. I'm not questioning that. But I am questioning this because it's never appeared in print. I'm not, I'm not a, I, what is it, I, What is your question? Is the, the, the Act gives the director of the EPA, the administrator of the EPA, or any other citizen, any person may petition the administrator to designate as a greenhouse gas any anthropogenic gas uh, one metric ton of which makes the same or greater contribution to global warming over a hundred years as one metric ton of CO2. Well, that's a scientific question. Yeah. So that would have to be have... determined by the scientists at EPA. Well, that's what we I'm know that other, We know that uh, other, other gases contribute to uh, greenhouse emissions just as we uh, know about CO2. Methane, for example, is a, a contributor, and there are others. And so and identifying a greenhouse House gas under this under this uh, title, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency is supposed to determine uh, the science well, could, could before we get they regulate. An, Mr. Chairman, could we get an answer? I mean, I don't. Ex I understand we don't have a trained climatologist on the staff that I'm aware of, but that is something I would like to see and see what what that number is, because everything in this act is based on whether you regulate or not is based on that standard. Well, I think you can contact EPA. We certainly had hearings, and that could have been brought up at the hearings. We've not had a hearing on this part of the bill. Well, Mr. Chairman, a second. That's, very well that's, 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 we didn't have a hearing on the uh, allocations in Title IV, but we had our draft out in time. This is Title III. I know. We had, we had a draft out that included Title III before uh, the, um, the uh, April recess. And after that, Mr. Markey held extensive hearings. Uh, he, had, uh, he had hearings that uh, I think went on a whole f four or five days with hundreds of witnesses. The uh, GWP values and the sources for the calculation are contained in the IPCC reports. That's the basis for it. We incorporate that in Title III. We leave it up to EPA to see, to see whether uh, uh, and to measure whether a, a, a a gas is con a contributor to greenhouse consequences based well, on the science. Before I ask the question of counsel, did you know that was in this bill? You asking me? Yes, sir. Well, you, you, I certainly you're... don't claim to know everything that's in this bill. I know that we left it to, uh, we relied very heavily on the scientists, on the IPCC and others in the consensus that they have that there is a problem of uh, global warming. It's having an impact, and that uh, we need to try to reduce it by the amounts that they think we need uh, to achieve in order to avoid uh, some of the consequences. Uh, that's well, what I, I know, I, but I don't know the details. I'm asking a question. I rely on the scientists. I'm asking a question, Mr. Chairman, that I don't know the answer to, uh -huh. but that does appear to me to be a very, very low standard. Because what little I do know is that when you're generating billions of tons, billions of tons on an annual basis, and those billions of tons at most are going to have a very minor impact on 
temperature in the next 50 to 100 years to have in the law a standard that you can regulate a greenhouse gas or a, ga a man-made gas uh, based on one metric ton over 100 years, I believe is, I don't know this, but I think that's a very, very low threshold. And I would like, I mean, I'll be happy to write the letter myself to the EPA and find out what that, that is. That, that's in there not as the threshold that for which regulation is required. It's in there as a threshold for determining whether a substance is a greenhouse gas. The, the thresholds are actually given later on. There has to be over 25,000 tons of, of greenhouse gas emissions and that's some before of the they're questions covered. That and the, the, the chart on 712, the global or the carbon dioxide equivalents are a way of comparing uh, different, uh, different gases. Well, now that you brought that up, let me just I'll ask. Well, let me ask, let me ask the gentleman that you're already four over four. Well, I've, I've had a lot of time, Mr. Chairman. I'm, if there's other people, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not trying to be the only one. Yes, well, Mr. Anybody on the Democratic side? Mr. Rogers, you seek recognition? Well, he'll have another chance. No, he'll have another chance. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be a microphone hog. Enjoy the dialogue, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was a little concerned that the Chairman said he didn't know everything that was in the bill when it's the single largest energy tax that we've ever applied to the United States of America. That scares me a little bit, not going to kid you. Uh, for counsel, if I could, on uh, page 423, could you describe to me what an international offset credit is? I'm sorry, sir, could you give me the the line number, I'm not seeing uh, it. It is down in uh, line 20 on page 423. I think I have the most updated. Sorry, 433? 423? 423, I'm sorry. 423, line 20. International offset credits. It says a sir, covered. Are you working off the, the bill or the substitute? Well, then you may have me there. If it's, if it's the printed version, that would be the the bill, not the substitute. That would be the bill. While you're getting there, I'll read it. A covered entity may use one international offset credit in lieu of an emission allowance up to the amount permitted. And the president may apparently waive that to two, mil two billion specified in other paragraphs. So could you explain that to me? I'm sorry, sir. I'm trying to get a copy of the the, the bill as introduced. Yeah, and I, I will apologize. I don't know what it is under the copy of which you're working under. All right, I'd give you that one as well. Do you have, you have one of these? I need to borrow that real quick. Would you like to borrow this one? Here you go. We, we've got, got it. it. Thank you. <laughs> International offset credits are credits that are issued pursuant to Section 743 of the uh, of the clean. I understand Act. that, but in for for us laymen, what does that mean? What is an international credit? Is that a credit that's obtained by emissions that that are reduced overseas for a project that is uh, an overseas project that reduces emissions or that sequesters carbon? So if I build a plant, if I'm say Nike that has plants in Thailand or China or Bangladesh, as they do, supports this bill, and they build a plant there, and they can use credits for a plant that they build there. Is that correct? Help me understand that. Uh, there are. Is that what an inter I'm just, just just basically on an international credit? I use Nike as an example. We'll call it Company A. There, there are detailed. Uh, requirements under Section 743 that explain what, what
what is necessary for it to be an international offset credit. Okay. All of those requirements. But, but let me just make sure I understand it now. That's why we're asking counsel is that if I'm a company, company A, I build a facility inter outside of the continental United States, I can use any credit from that to apply back to the United States for for my uh, emissions? Is that the best way I read no, this? No, it, it needs to meet specific uh, requirements and... Well, let me ask you, where, where would the international company be if it were out, not outside the United States or international offset? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? I'm, I'm just trying to understand what an international offset is. An international offset credit is a... Um, credit that companies in the United States can use in lieu of an emission allowance in lieu of an emission allowance to cover their greenhouse gas emissions. It is um, generated by an action that's taken outside the United States to reduce greenhouse gas emissions outside of the United States that can then be sold to the company inside the United States. So could that in could that include a company that is doing carbon sequest uh, sequestration Overseas? The generator of the offset credit is the Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to understand how this works. I mean, it's obviously fairly complicated, but how, how am I going to get a credit if I'm a company in Detroit, Michigan? Over, how do I get that? How do I qualify for that? What does that mean? Does that right mean I. Have, if without I have, objection, the gentleman would be given two additional minutes. Thank you. Uh, currently, there are U.S. companies that go out and develop what are called offset projects where they undertake sequestration projects in um, other countries. Th these would apply only in developing countries. So in a developing country, they might go in and um, replant forests, for example, and generate, generate emission uh, carbon reductions. All right. Can they make improvements to existing facilities overseas in a, develop, uh, in a developing country? That would be determined under the, the rules that EPA would set out. So, but it's possible they could make the rule that if a company that has no carbon sequestration goes to that, that would qualify for an international credit, right, because they've improved? Uh, potentially under, how, however, mm. EPA would have to develop the rules first. There, there's an extensive set of criteria in the statute for what EPA would require in addition to an agreement with the, uh, with the developing country, uh, okay, between so, the U.S. But, and the developing country. But as the bill stands today, there's nothing in this law that would prohibit that, is there? No. There's nothing in there to prohibit it. So, wow. So if General Motors, which now has been told by the administration, can import more cars from China in 2011, they could use this provision to make an improvement on a plant in China and then use the credit back here as well. Is that correct? If they meet the EPA rules, it's not prohibited. That would not be prohibited under this law. Is that correct? It's not prohibited. It would have to be an international agreement between the U.S. and the host country first that would establish the criteria for judging whether an emissions reduction had occurred. Really? Where is that in the bill? Where is that? Yes. That is um, working off the um, So if, if China would want to increase its production and I come up with this agreement, I could clearly set up a regime. All I have to do is have an agreement with the United States that meets certain criteria. I'm sorry. Ow. That's a little scary, Mr. Chairman. Did you know that it was in there? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. What is your What is your uh, concern? Well, uh, you know, uh, part of the uh, uh, agreement that is being proffered by the Car Committee in this administration is that th we will import more cars in starting in 2011 from China and South Korea. The international offset credit would allow them, to, under some agreement that they could agree to, it's not prohibited under this, to actually make no improvements here but increase. Uh, their are production you, overseas to send it back to the well, United Well, gentlemen, yield to me. Are you speculating that it could happen? Uh, it's not prohibited, yes. Well, I a lot am. of things are not prohibited. Would, you, would you have believed that this administration would have pushed car companies to import more cars and no, put Americans No, I don't believe they have. Them? Absolutely they have, Mr. I don't Chairman. I would encourage have. you to read the language. Matter of fact, the UAW believes it, too. The UAW is circulating a letter today. Are you disagreeing, Mr. Chairman, with the United Auto Workers? <laughs> it won't be the first time. Well, that's an interesting position for you to be in, Mr. Chairman. They certainly believe it. And I, it's kind of funny. You, you probably, uh, you and I don't agree. Well, I, 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 gentlemen, uh, time well, has I think expired, but let me just indicate that 
uh, you're very much more attuned to this than I would, but I have never heard from any source that this administration is trying to encourage the importation of cars from Asia at the expense of the cars that are produced here in the United States. As I, I understand, did you ask counsel whether you, something could could be done? And I would be and happy it, to work on an amendment together, Mr. Chairman, to prohibit that, including these international offsets overseas. Well, I wouldn't want to support that. And I'll get that. you the letter from the UAW today. I can get you a I'd copy. I'd be happy to receive it. And maybe you, uh, you may well convince me they took that position. But, it didn't you, but I, that doesn't mean it's going to convince me that uh, that the Obama administration has taken that position. It may be, well, a preemptive letter by the UAW. Uh, or you can't convince me that uh, I should react to something that hasn't happened. Um, Isn't our gentleman's time has expired. Before it happens, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, shouldn't we prevent it before it happens, though? As I guess well, we let's see what you want to come up with, and I'll look at it. So you will, you'll work with me on some prohibitive Well, and I'll, I'll be happy to look and see what the letter uh, you want to draft, and, um, and I'd like to get more information about it. Yeah. And this, this is what worries me, Mr. Chairman, when we don't really know what's in the bill and what's at stake for well, families that are if trying I can, to burn If their I can reclaim my time now, because I'm going to recognize myself. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want questions to be asked like, isn't it possible that something could happen to which no lawyer would say it's not possible, and then if you can't say it's impossible, you jump to the conclusion it's going to happen. That, that just seems to me... Um, In fairness, Mr. Chairman, no, I, no, no, I, haven't yielded, I haven't yielded to the gentleman. You've had your time. You haven't yielded. And that's wh what I fear may be happening and suspect may be happening. But I'll be glad to look at it with the gentleman because if, um, if there's a concern and there's an effort to try to head off an attempt by anybody in the Bush administration to take a strategy to bring in more foreign cars, I, 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 if anything, this administration has been working with the auto industry uh, to promote the sale of cars. The, the, the um, Sutton Amendment was supported by the Obama administration to get more cars purchased in the United States. The Obama administration has uh, uh, been working with the auto industry to try to figure out their viability for the future. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't want uh, people to start hearing things said at a hearing that uh, is going to make them fear something that isn't happening. But if, you, if there's an attempt to prevent somebody from doing something at the administration by urging them not to do it, I'll be glad to look at it. Um, I, I want to now uh, recognize Mr. Barton for five minutes more. He had some questions, and then I'm going to recognize Ms. Eshoo to offer her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to try to be try to be concise here. Um, I, I I want to first bring members' attention to page 422 on line. Nine, it says United States greenhouse gas emissions were other than 7.2 or 7,206 million metric tons. Uh, th that's a requirement that the administrators, that's, that's apparently the baseline of anthropogenic um, CO2 emission in the United States in 2005. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, now my question to Council, if that's what the baseline is, where, where do we get the 4,627 emission allowance baseline in 2012? Why is that number not identical to 7,206? It, it reflects a number of things. One, there's a 3% uh, a reduction, the, the target that comes from Section 703. Right. And then second, this only applies to capped sectors or capped sources and that is less than total U.S. greenhouse gas. Well, what are the uncapped sources? The Because it's about 2.6, 2,600 minus 3 percent tons. In, in 2012, the, the uncapped sectors would include, it, it, actually the statute goes through and lists the capped sectors or the capped sources, which would be easier. And in 2016, that is electricity generators, it is refiners and importers of fuel, 
and fluorinated gas manufacturers and uh, nitrogen trifluoride uh, emitters. So is it true that all of agriculture is exempt? Uh, agriculture is not listed as a covered entity. So it's exempt. Uh, covered entities are defined in uh, Section 713 on page 535. It's an electricity source, stationary source that produces uh, for sale or distribution petroleum-based or coal-based liquid fuel, uh, a stationary source that produces um, for sale in, in bulk fluorinated, uh, fluorinated gases and other industrial gases, uh, stationary sources that emit nitrogen trifluoride, a geologic sequestration site, uh, I, I understand. I, I, I've, I've read the things that are covered. I just want to make sure that there are large sectors that are specifically exempt from this act. Would, May, would you yield to me to ask yeah, a question? Sure. If, a, if a, uh, an entity is not covered, does that mean it's exempt? I, I, a covered entity would not have to comply with the uh, requirements in Title. Uh, not a cover something that is a, not a covered uncovered entity. entity. Would not have to. Would not have, would not to, have to fly. Okay. No. But we are, this act doesn't, to use the chairman's terminology, doesn't cover uh, 2,600 man made tons of CO2 in the United States. I, I'm sorry, sir, could you give me the. Well, I'm just subtracting the first line, the first number on 2012. 4,627 from 7,206, and I, I agree that you, you've got to reduce that number by 3 percent because you want we the chairman and the people that support the bill want reductions 3 percent below that base, the 2005 baseline. There, there are covered entities that, that are covered under, the, uh, under Title VII later uh, that are not covered in 2012. Well, I'm, I'm about out of time, so am I? I would like some ex any entity that is covered that ex that has an emission of 25,000 tons of CO2 a year, uh, if it's if it's listed as as a covered entity and it it's that much CO2, it it has to comply. What is an example of of 25,000 tons of CO2? What would does does a, does a truck stop emit 25,000 tons of CO2? Does a does a, uh, a a truck stop uh, would not be a covered entity under the the definitions of covered entities because it's it doesn't it's not one of these sp specific listed it, it's only things that are specifically listed or that fall into those categories that are covered okay all right all others would be uncovered correct okay my last because I'm at the zero limit on page four hundred and fifty. The, the act sets up a strategic reserve. Without objection, the gentleman would be given one additional minute. It sets up a strategic reserve where, where, depending on the year, a certain percentage of the allowance is listed on page 420 is set aside to be, to be auctioned off uh, for those entities that need to, to purchase allowances. But it sets a minimum strategic auction price of $28 uh, in 2009 dollars, now, and then it goes up 5% a year plus inflation, and then beginning in 2015, it's the price, the minimum, minimum price goes up to 60% above a th rolling 36-month average. Now, $28 is a much higher number than $10 or $12 or $17. So my question, and this is really more to the chairman then to the council, is it not true that the minimum cost of this bill is going to be that $28 times the number of allowances that have to be auctioned, which even in year one is over a thousand tons? Uh, the, the, I don't think that's a correct assumption uh, because the uh, maybe council can go f uh, explain this further, but we don't look at it as just the allowances. There are a lot of other things in, in, in play, and a lot of the reductions will be achieved by other means than the allowances themselves. In fact, it would be in the interest of any covered entity 
to look for the least effect cost least costly way to achieve the reductions required in that period of time and not have to use the allowances that they have at their disposal. Is that correct, Council? Yeah, that, that's correct, sir. That, that there are uh, sources will have some, or at least some sources will have reductions they can make that will be cheaper than $28 a ton. Uh, some sources will either uh, be given allowances or will uh, have allowances that they can buy that, that should be, uh, EPA modeling says, would be less than $28 a ton. They can also buy international and domestic offsets and use those for, uh, use those for compliance as well. And this is, uh, the strategic reserve is there um, more as a, a safety measure than, than as an expected. Well, uh, if the uh, gentleman would yield to me further, yeah. the compliance does not uh, come only through the use of the allotments uh, in the, in the uh, market. It can come from other ways of achieving the reductions. But as I also want to point out, in 2012, the cap is going to cover only the electricity sector, transportation, and, uh, and the fuels, and fluorinated gases. In 2014, industrial sources come in. In 2016, natural gas local distribution companies come in. Uh, so I think we have to recognize that there's a, a, a progression. By 2016, the draft covers 84.5 percent of U.S. emissions. So there is a phase in of the covered uh, entities and what, uh, what, uh, what goals will be achieved by them. The gentleman's time has expired, and the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bono, requested an opportunity to uh, engage in some questions, and I wanted to recognize her before I call on Ms. Eshoo to offer her amendment. I thank the chair. and. Uh I want to take this opportunity to thank Council for your hard work and well, the Chairman and Ranking uh, Member for feeding us um, for a couple of days. So a uh, question for Council is, uh, the RES in this legislation Somebody's takes a step in the right direction, in my opinion, this is minimum. Uh, to include waste to energy facilities, but they're qualified in the bill. Now, I've toured a facility in my district, and I'm very excited um, about the potential this technology has to remove matter from our landfills to produce clean energy. So I just wanted to ask Council a few questions on portions of how this energy source is qualified. On uh, page 15, line 14, begins the definition of qualified waste to energy. Included in that definition, the following requirements, it says, uh, such terms shall include only the energy derived from the non-fossil biogenic portion of such, such waste or debris. But can you explain why we only count the biogenic portion of the uh, waste from waste to energy. Is your question about the intent? Uh, it's the question is just seems to, so, uh, it, it doesn't make sense why you're incentivizing uh, landfill gas is at full, at a full credit, but waste to energy gets a partial credit and it is 10 times more efficient than landfill gas, but we're definitely picking and choosing winners here and I'm wondering why you're qualifying it and then just counting the biogenic uh, portion of what is actually generated, why you're separating uh, out the electricity that is created from one of these facilities. I, I can't speak to the rationale behind that. All right. Then looking at section uh, C1 on the next page, uh, moving on from that, but still concerning uh, waste to energy facilities, if the concern is that these facilities will go online without the necess necessary permitting and be either dangerous or in some way negatively impact the environment, why wouldn't we extend these re requirements to all sources of renewable energy? Are we less concerned about wind or, or uh, geothermal plants having the legally required permits? Why are we treating waste to energy differently than other sources? Gentlelady, yield to me. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The renewable portion of the municipal solid waste is the biogenic, biogenic portion uh, and what is this word here? paper, food waste, uh, and uh, cold board, et cetera. So that's, so that's what we talk about when we're talking about the uh, renewable portion of the solid waste. I hope that helps. It, it helps, Mr. Chairman, but it's just sort of common sense that if you put it in a landfill, it is going to create gas and you're going to use that gas, but you're going to, it is what one-tenth as efficient as if you burn it and, and uh, 
put it towards the, the waste to energy credits. It does, doesn't make sense that you are picking and choosing on where you're going to dispose of that product and actually do it in a much less efficient manner. Would you? Uh, if you yield to me, the part that um, that be, be, the biogenic part is the part that becomes the the gas. The rest of it is a solid waste and would not produce the gas. All right. Well, it, you know, when I toured this, I was just sort of a little bit stymied by some of the environmental positions that it is, it is uh, bad and less than favorable. And I, first of all, I appreciate your including it uh, in the bill. But uh, these facilities are very complex projects with enormous sophisticated equipment. How would a facility be treated in cases where malfunctions or equipment failures caused a facili uh, facility to be temporary, temporarily non-compliant? Council and answer that question. Council, Chairman, anybody? This, this section would be um, implemented by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and they would interpret the language here in their implementation. Do you believe that uh, that would have some sort of impact on the facility's annual certification? The gentlelady, yield to me. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You're raising some, some serious questions that, uh, that I'd like to review with you to see if, if we're doing exactly what we ought to be doing in this regard. And so if, if you would permit, why don't we uh, set aside these questions and go over it in, uh, in more detail because maybe we should look for a, a, some a further a refinement of the language. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Again, I just want to thank you for including it in the bill uh, to begin with and uh, appreciate the time. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Ms. Eshi was ready to go, but Mr. Pitt wants to ask some questions. Uh, just in follow-up to that. Let me ask you, Ms. Eshi, because we really should go back and forth. Uh, uh, Mr. Barton made a, quite a point of that uh, on our first day of the markup that we need to go uh, by tradition back and forth for recognition. Is it, would, would it be acceptable to you if Mr. Pitt asked his questions? Okay, Mr. Pitt, uh, I'd like to yield to you five minutes. Mr. Pitt, I don't know if you realize I called on you. You're recognized for five minutes to pursue some Thank you, Mr. Questions. Chairman. I was just going to follow up on the line of questioning, if, if you could clarify. Uh, I have. Hold, hold on a second. Let me set the timer again so you get yes, to five minutes. I thought you were about to ask questions, and I want you to be able to have the full opportunity. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could continue on the line of questioning. I have a waste to steam energy plant in my district and I visited. It's municipal waste. They uh, take out the metal and the plastic uh, and burn the rest. Now, under this bill, would that be considered a renewable energy source? Because they otherwise would landfill it and it would produce a lot of methane. Yes. The logic that, that uh, Ms. Bono was making, Bono Mac was making. So under this bill, you said the biogenic uh, portion would be renewable. Well, it's mixed municipal waste. Would that be a renewable resource? Could Council uh, respond to that question? I think it's a good one. It sounds like in this case, you're, the, the plastics and the metals, the non-biogenic materials removed, if the, what's left is the biogenic material, well, That's everything except plastic and metal is left. Now, is that biogenic? Is that renewable? I, don't, I can't speak to the specific facility, but the biogenic portion under the legislation would, would produce. And how do you determine the biogenic portion of municipal waste? 
Could you repeat that question? How do you determine the biogenic portion of municipal waste? Uh, this, this definition and uh, the overall section would be implemented by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They would have to uh, look at this definition and implement it. The, the, um, the question I have is, do waste esteem energy plants, which are quite efficient, and I've visited, and it's quite clean. You can look at the stack and not even see anything emission, emitting, uh, being emitted. Um, it, it does seem to be a renewable resource, should be considered renewable, and that is the question, Mr. Chairman, that I'm asking. Well, the, the, um, uh, the, the renewable is a bio, uh, biogenic portion. That comes from the paper, the food waste, the cold board, things like that. But the rest of it is not going to be, not well, going to be. Well, it renewed. burns, so I, I don't know if it's really? biogenic or not. But it, it okay. produces well, a lot of electricity in our area, and it's clean way. You know, when it's mm -hmm. done, there's a little bit of ash left that is put over the landfill as a cap. Well, let's take a further look at that. I think Thank that you. was the point. Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I could Mac continue, I, I have just a couple yes. of minutes. We were talking earlier about international offset credits and the International Climate Change Adaptation Program. And, you know, that sounds a little bit to me like the global fund that we voted on uh, last week. And I'm wondering who would administer this uh, program? Uh, and are there any oversight protections because there's not a lot of oversight on the global fund. I'm sorry. Gentlemen, yield to me. It's, it would be administered by EPA. There would be oversight within EPA and by the Congress. Uh, maybe Council wants to give any further explanation than that, but that's my understanding. They have to determine whether the offset is a genuine offset and uh, the, whether it would be uh, considered as a, an offset for the purposes of this act. The rules for is your mic on. The rules setting up the criteria for offsets would be established by EPA. EPA would have to require for yeah. each project third-party verification. They would have to require that the uh, emissions removal reduction or sequestration had already occurred prior to the granting of the offset credit, and there are provisions for audits on a periodic basis. And who would oversee? or administer the International Climate Change Adaptation Program. That's in Title IV. Would that, is there any oversight from an international body is another question. Yes, as I understand it, it would be the State Department and the USAID, our, our government agencies. And, and uh, are there protections to ensure against waste, fraud, and abuse is, is a question I would have. Well, that's the job of um, the people within the administration to watch out for that, and it's the job of Congress to pursue it through oversight. Yeah, I think. Section 494. Uh, subsection C provides for oversight and uh, designates the secretary. What page is that? Sorry, it's page uh, 937 of the substitute. The secretary of state or such other federal agency head as the president may designate in consultation with the administrator of USAID shall oversee the distribution of allowances available to carry out the program to a multilateral fund or international institution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pitt. Uh, Ms. Eshoo, I, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, Mr. Barton said he didn't th uh, think he could support your amendment. That would mean, after debate, we'd go to a vote on your amendment. Uh, but we're waiting for uh, members to return. We indicated there would be no votes before 8.30, but that's only seven minutes away. There are people at the White House who want to be here and we want to have here on both sides of the aisle uh, to uh, respond to any vote because, um, uh, 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 to be fair, and so we are waiting for them to return. But I think uh, that uh, we ought to have a, a Republican 
amendment to Title III, and I was informed that Mr. Murphy has a, a, an amendment to Title III that uh, would engender a great deal of debate. I don't know if yours would engender that much debate. It seems to me your amendment is a pretty straightforward one, and I don't know why it wouldn't be accepted just on a voice vote. But on the other hand, uh, the rules that the Republican leader on the committee have set for us is that if there is an amendment that they don't find acceptable, they want to have a roll call vote. And we're not ready to go to a roll call vote. So what I'm saying is uh, that I, I wish Mr. Murphy would arrive, as, uh, and he is on his way. So w w let's sit tight for a minute. And uh, the gentleman um, has some questions he wishes to ask. Well, then why don't I recognize you for uh, five minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Council, and again, I just want to try to understand. This is, uh, again, the bill, the bill form on page 437, line 8, uh, entitled the Minim Minimum Strategic Reserve Auction Price in Subsequent Years. I, uh, yes. First of all, could you describe what a what the minimum strategic reserve auction price, uh, excuse me, the the uh, strategic reserve auction is? The the bill would set aside a number of allowances in the strategic reserve. It specifies the percentage that will be drawn, uh, that that will that the number and the percentage that will be put into the strategic reserve. And then quarterly, there is an auction of a specified number of allowances from the reserve. And, and what might an allowance be? Or what, what might go into the strategic reserve? What is it? Is it a metric ton of something? Is it a, it, it's, it's some quantity of some. It's allowances rate. that go into the reserve. And who establishes what that allowance is? Uh, section 720. Um, Section 721 establishes what the allowances are. Okay. And, and those and allowances then, are things that have been established by the government as some entity that would qualify for an allowance. Is that correct? It, Under the it, law? The, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what you were saying. That, 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 that the panel, the government, decides what quantity or what is what would qualify as a quantity to relate to an allowance that could be put into the reserve. So it's, it establishes what that quantity of whatever it is. The, and, and allowance is the authorization to emit one ton of carbon dioxide okay, that was the That was the point where I was getting to. Good. And in, in this particular case, it says the auction price shall be 60 percent above a rolling 36-month average. Help me understand what that means. That, that means the administrator would look at what the average price of allowances had been over the three-year period or 36-month period leading up to the auction, and then the average of that price would be the minimum floor price or the reserve price for the auction. Plus 60 percent. Plus 60 percent, yes. And why 60 percent? I don't understand that. That the statute sets 60 percent uh, above the average price as, as the floor price for the reserve. And the average price would be determined by the auction or is it determined by trading of that particular? It's the 36-month uh, average of the daily closing price for that year's emission allowance vintage as reported in unregistered carbon trading facilities right, so, calculated using So this dollars. is now a commodity trade. So Wall Street is trading the value of this metric ton. Is that correct? The, the, the That's how that would work? Allowances may be traded. Okay. So, uh, just, so some financial market, I, I'll say Wall Street, trades this metric ton. And over 36 months, they affix a value to that. This is day three of the House Energy and Commerce Committee markup of the climate change bill. Our live coverage tonight will continue on C-SPAN 2 and more of the markup tomorrow here on C-SPAN 3 starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Chairman Henry Waxman says he plans for the committee to finish work on the bill this week. So a company who... Coming up over the next hour here on C-SPAN 3, highlights of today's coverage, including some of Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner's testimony.